You guys ready? <laughs> Day two of algorithmic composition stuff. Fundamentals. Um, just checking in with you guys. Uh, I, the reading reflection, just a heads up. Remember, chapter eight's due on Monday. Uh, some of you are staying on top of these. Some of you are missing quite a few. And, and the policy is they need to be made up within a week. So uh, if you're missing too many at this point, you're, you're, you're falling behind, basically. Uh, but I guess that's where maybe the extra credit for reflecting on presentation one could come into play. You could help make up some ground there. Um, but just make sure you're staying on top of the reading reflections because they, they do come weekly, basically, although I think I have a reprieve a couple weeks coming up, basically. Uh, and then looking ahead to your algorithmic composition project, don't forget that your annotated bibliography is due Tuesday, so that's, that's after this weekend. So be talking about that in your group, who's doing what. Um, I, again, I expect one per group, so if that means you farm it out to one person or you uh, divide it up so that two people do two different sources or each person does one source because there's four of you in the group, that, that that's however you want to divide up the workload on that. Uh, but you do need, uh, again, to do uh, some bibliographic research uh, and the division needs to be one of your um, one of the books that's on reserve, one that's a web source, and one that's something else from the library, okay? Uh, again, be checking back to that bibliography on Blackboard as well. I've got all those uh, books listed, although, like I said, there's been a, quite a lot of good additions as well. But some of the ones that are listed there for, for algorithmic composition are very good, uh, particularly the Gareth Loy book. And I actually pull a little bit of information from that today uh, in talking about pitch classes, okay? Uh, and then presentations are a week from Tuesday, so it's going to come fast, okay? Uh, about that, we're working on uh, this. You guys are aware of kind of a direction to go in to start uh, working on these uh, problems. We talked about that last time. Uh, you know your new group assignments. Uh, requirements, I wanted to be a little more explicit about these. It's the same format as before. We were giving a 10 to 15 minute presentation. Uh, but in terms of your patch, I do want you to use a game controller. I, I, I'm essentially interested in you using a non-keyboard or mouse as a controller on this uh, algorithmic composition. Yeah. Does it have to be a game controller, or could we use something like Touch OSC? You could definitely use Touch OSC. Yes. So I'm looking for a non, not a mouse, not a computer keyboard, something that you have to move around and control. Okay. Uh, whether that's a game controller, I, I don't know, did that, did that class go well last week? I didn't get an update from you guys or a report as far as if you got things working? Okay. Uh, we didn't, I didn't use my Xbox controller. Apparently, Max don't have Windows drivers for Xbox controllers. Ah, okay. But you were able to get some game controllers in here and get them yeah. talking and see the data come out inside of Max? Okay. Um, uh, maybe not game controller, but maybe we'll, we'll put this in terms of like alternate controller. Does everybody know what I mean by that, basically? Again, non-standard computer controller, okay? <laughs> uh, there's uh, multiple ways we could express this, but ultimately it means not a mouse, not a keyboard, uh, something that you have to input gestural information for. Uh, and then I want you to incorporate, the, part of the reason for mixing up the groups and having a little bit larger groups this time is that there's somebody from each of the first three groups in your group, which means you have access to three synthesis uh, instruments that you built for the first round of presentations, you should be able to use at least two of those, possibly with some tweaks and additions, as the actual sound engine for your algorithmic composition project. Okay, So there's no need to reinvent the synthesis wheel at this point unless you want to be further tweaking that. And maybe you want to divide up responsibilities of like, hey, you know, Leo, we really like the pluck string. Could you build some more control parameters for that so that we can do x, y, and z with it? Um, you can divide up the workload like that amongst the group. Uh, but I want you to incorporate at least two of those instruments. Uh, to be clear, I'm not looking for you, you shouldn't be rehashing the topics from your synthesis presentations though in this presentation. The presentation needs to be on algorithmic composition. So don't, don't feel like you have to, if you are reusing your uh, physical model instrument, you have to rehash what physical modeling is in this presentation. The presentation needs to be on the algorithmic composition techniques that you're using. Okay. Um, but I want you to incorporate at least two of those. I'm not, I didn't want to make it a stipulation you have to use all three of the instruments from the first time because maybe you decide this one's not uh, in the game plan as far as what we want to use it for, okay? Uh, and then Tuesday, I'm not anticipating spending the whole class on this, but I do want to at least expose you to techniques for getting max 
multiple copies of Macs to talk to each other across the network. Okay, there are several techniques for doing that. I want to expose you to that on um, Tuesday. I, pro I anticipate not taking the entire class for that, so you will have some time for working and getting consultation with me. Um, but I want to expose you to some of those techniques and put it within the realm of possibility that you could uh, give your presentation up here using this computer, but when it comes time to actually giving the demonstration, it could be running on multiple machines talking to one another uh, here in this, this lab. You've got 20 some odd machines in here. Why not use four or five of them talking to one another, okay? Um, if you want to go in that route. I at least want to expose you to that idea that computer music doesn't necessarily need to be one computer working on its own. It could actually be multiple computers talking to one another across the network, okay? Um, so I'm introducing that next week on Tuesday, okay? Which means I got to get through the rest of this fundamentals of algorithmic composition stuff today. Uh, and not to scare you, but I have 42 slides in my presentation, which is a lot for a class. Uh, some of them are very quick, like build to explain a concept over five slides, basically. But um, hopefully I can get through everything. If not, uh, I'll work something else out, basically. Maybe record an extra video in my uh, office later on today and post it to YouTube so you can watch it that way. Again, don't don't forget that these videos are recorded, so if you need to recap something, uh, you can always re-watch what it is I explained in class, okay? Um, so, we mentioned this last time, yes? Chromatic scale, half steps, okay? And the idea that defining it as half steps above the tonic is extremely useful for algorithmic composition purposes, okay? Um, because it allows us to do several things, okay? So I'm recap recapping what I had at the end of class, and here's that Musimathics uh, Volume 1 reference. That, that book's in the library, and in fact, I think they, they might have two copies because I requested it and they were already ordering it, unless they got rid of one of their copies, I'm not sure, but that Volume 1 is entirely about, or almost entirely about algorithmic composition pro processes. Um, uh, I talked about using the clock face, right? And the idea that you can define pitch structures, and pitch structures is nothing more than a, a, a meta category for things like scales and chords, okay? Uh, using this clock face notation, it's very easy to pick out the steps in the scale, the steps or the structure of the uh, chord, whether it be a tri triad or uh, a four pitch chord, etc., okay? <laughs> Um, you can then unwind that into a set, okay? Not to scare you, but we're, we're, we're actually dealing with some set theory here, basically. They put it in mathematical terms if you've taken advanced mathematics courses, okay? Um, so the, the, the set of a diatonic scale, of a major scale, is this 0, 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11. It's defining the half steps above the tonic, okay? And you can then ask for the second scale degree, know that it's four half steps above the tonic, simply add back in your tonic and get the right pitch for it on the output side for your synthesis engine, okay? Uh, the nice thing about this structure is that you can then also ask for different scale degrees, in this case the fourth one, you know that it's seven half steps above the tonic and you get the right pitch out, okay? This also allows you to change the scale out, which in this case I'm cha exchanging major for minor. minor? No, because I lowered the fifth as well. The, uh, so I'm not sure exactly what you scale must have I'm lowered the third and the sixth. I, have I know the I lowered the third, but the third and the fifth. Maybe you lowered the fifth. That's sure, it's a scale. It doesn't have a perfect <laughs> fifth in it. Okay. Uh, you can and you can delete entries in this as well. There's no reason it has to be a seven note uh, scale. It can be a three note or three pitch chord or a four pitch chord, okay? Um, you can input that information and still have your engine asking for the fourth scale degree telling you that it's six half steps above the tonic, add the tonic back in and you get the right pitch, okay? Um, same thing with changing out the tonic, you can change out that, that information and ask for a different scale degree and still get the right note in the whatever the prevailing chord or pitch structure is at that time, okay? Um, okay, so jumping back to that, I mean, that's, that's the kind of general idea of these pitch class structures and pulling out different scale degrees, adding it to the tonic, and getting the right pitch, okay? 
let's connect this with MIDI, okay? The clock face has how many scale, how many uh, steps in it? Including the zero. 12, right? Okay, so there's 12 steps because there's 12 pitches in a Western chromatic scale, right? Uh, if we're looking at the, the musical keyboard from C to the next C, there's 12 notes, okay? Um, to relate this to MIDI, okay, the range of numbers used for pitch class or specific pitch classes is 12, right? Okay, so in this in this notation here, um, if you want to think of it this way, zero can be like your C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, okay? You can think of it in those terms. And you're always going to, in a Western uh, equal tempered scale, okay, which is what our, our piano keyboards use, okay, you're always going to have 12 different pitch classes available to you. Okay, for 0 through 11, okay. What's the range of numbers used for MIDI? 128 values, okay. It just so happens that in those 128 values, middle C is used, is number 60, okay. And it just so happens, not by accident, that 60 is divisible by 12. Oh, wait, there's 12 here, there's 12 divided into here, basically. See how this is all starting to feed into one another here, okay. So one of the things you can do is know that um, if you want to change octaves, all you have to do is add 12, or add a multiple of 12, add 24, add 36. You, you're, all, you're, say, you're playing then the same pitch class, but changing octaves, okay? So 12 becomes a kind of magical number in terms of being able to change octaves. Uh, and staying within 12 allows you to define these pitch structures, okay? So to, to further connect this, how do we start to, so I, I, this is all world of concept, okay, up until this point. Now let's see, some of you are conceptual people and you need that conceptual grounding. Some of you are really hands-on practical people, but yeah, how do I make this work in Max, right, okay? That's where I want to go now, okay? How to make this work in Max? Well, okay, you know this, note in, mini pitch, right? Everybody understands these first two objects, okay? Here's where it gets maybe a little fuzzy for you guys, okay? Although you know mathematical operators, right? You know the slash. The slash is what? What mathematical operation? Divide. Division, right? Okay. So divide by 12, okay? There's the modulo operator. Who knows the modulo operator? Michael, Leo, what does modulo do? Leo? Uh, it's, it gives you the remainder of the two, um, two numbers. The two numbers in what sort of operation, Michael? Uh, basically, it takes the pitch, divides it by 12, gives you the remainder. Gives you the remainder, okay, of a, well, in general terms, it's the remainder of a division operation, okay? So, before you knew how to do floating point math, right, and you knew that, uh, I don't know, 10 divided by 3 was actually 3.3333333, right, okay? Remember back to grade school when you used to do it with a remainder, okay? and you did three remainder one, okay? The divide operator without a floating point number here will give you the whole number. The modulo operator without a floating point number here will give you the remainder, okay? So this is actually, as complicated as it look, this is grade school division here, okay? If you do, if you were to throw these two operations at 10 divided by 3, okay, you're going to get 3 remainder 1, okay? Where this is useful for MIDI pitch and we're dealing with these pitch classes is that you can use it to get what octave am I in? Because if as soon as you divide by 12, 60 is divided by 12, and we tend to in musical skip. Who's taking a lot of music theory, right? Aiden and Eric and Colby, okay? So... Uh, we tend to identify the octave based on what, what note starts the octave in music theory circles. Which, which letter? A, B, C, right? Okay. You tend to talk about it as C1, C2, C3, okay? The number of which octave you're in starts with the C, okay? The fact that C is is 60 in MIDI and is divisible by 12 means that if we divide by 12 and look for the whole number, we now know which octave on the keyboard we're in. Everybody follow me then? Okay. Then the modulo operator can tell us which pitch class, C through B, 
Okay, so let's let's build this patch real quick, just so you got a a, a sense of this. Um, I don't have this pre-built, so let me go ahead and. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it. Well, I'll I'll put it here, but I also I want to build it too, so I can play around with it. So I'll flip back to it when I need to. Um, math max. Okay, so I don't have a MIDI keyboard connected, so I'll s the note in is not as important as boop, 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 having an integer and then having a divide by 12. And it's important that this stays an integer here, the 12, not a 12 point, because then you'll start to get floating point math. So there, I mean, there is a method to leaving things in integers. Uh, new. I was going to say, if we just modulo it, 12. Blown up or something, we would just be able to, you know, it would be able to recognize whether it have sharp or flat, I guess, and it would be. Uh, yes and no, because, it, well, when you're dealing with a MIDI keyboard, it's always going to be an integer anyway. The, the information coming out of your MIDI keyboard is always going to be an integer. Uh, let's leave floating point pitches for when we get to machine learning, where we actually have the microphone sensing what pitch you're singing. Okay. Then you actually will get a floating point number that's related to MIDI. Okay, so I can increase the size of this. Okay, so now I can say 60. I type it in the top number box and I hit return. I get five in terms of octave, and I get zero in terms of pitch class. And as I increase this number, notice how the 5 stays the same, but the other one increases. Okay. So this is telling me what pitch class I am. Okay, 0 through 11. Okay. For some of you, that might be too abstract to think 0 through 11 and connect 0 with C and 2 with D and... Uh, four with E, okay? That might be a little too abstract for you guys. The integer box, maybe unbeknownst to you, has the ability to change what type of information is being displayed, okay? So if you click on your number box down here, and I think it's, at, at, no, I is not gonna work. Let's open the sidebar then. Go to the sidebar and click on inspector. Oh, I have to, oh, I have to, un that's what I have to do. So I had to unlock it, I had to highlight this number box here. Okay, and I went to the inspector in the side panel. Right here, you'll notice there's an option to display as decimal or hex or roll and octal, which hex and roll and octal don't get used too much, but MIDI does. And notice what happens when you switch it to MIDI. Yeah. Now, it's, it's also trying to display octave information as well, but the fact that we're staying within 0 to, to 11 means that we're in a really low octave, basically. But the thing I wanted to point out here is that the number box has different modes in terms of display format, and one of those modes is um, actually displaying the note letter names. If, so if you're someone that thinks better with the note letter names because you've got them ingrained in your brain from years of music theory training, okay, you can actually ch change max to reflect your thinking, okay? Okay? So I just wanted to point that out there, okay? There's a minus one. Uh, it's F1. So F, F in the octave range of, yeah, of, of C. Yeah, because well, I can do the same thing up here. Watch if I change this one, unlock. Like if you go to sixty, it'll say C four. If you change the top note. See how this is now F five? It's showing you the octave information. It's this is actually A sharp minus one. And as I keep doing this, see now I'm in octave six. I'm in octave seven. Yeah. But the octave numbers change depending on. Uh, when I cross the C. So there's D, there's C sharp, there's C. Now as soon as I hit B, I'm at B5. Okay. This is staying in negative 1 territory because I've, I've done this module operator. It's always going to be between 0 and 11, which is 
defined as the negative one octave. Okay, so if it's if it's too confusing, don't worry about don't make this change basically. But I'm just showing you that you can you can get these number boxes to show you uh, many uh, I say note letter pitch letters basically. Okay, that's what I wanted to point out here. I'm gonna actually switch this back because I want to be able to manipulate these numbers. Okay, so let me flip back to my uh, ah okay. So the rest of what I'm showing you here, this is so this is analysis coming in, getting you to octave and pitch, you can actually work the process in reverse. You can, based on octave and pitch, which you might be generating through some random processes, like which octave you want to be in and which pitch you want to play at any given time, you can actually then turn that into uh, a MIDI pitch by first multiplying by 12 and then adding it to your pitch class it will spit out the MIDI note number that you need in order to make the proper pitch. So the, the thing I want to point out here is the bottom half of this patch is, ex is exactly the inverse process as the top half of this patch. I'm basically going from MIDI pitch to octave plus pitch class, and then I'm going from octave plus pitch class back to MIDI pitch. Okay, There may be situations where one half of this process is advantageous to you. You might want to generate randomly octave and pitch class information and have MIDI pitch come out the other side so that you're driving your synthesizer using the proper MIDI pitch. Everybody see that? Any, any questions so far? Okay. Let's go deeper down the rabbit hole then. Okay. The next step then is to start to, uh, these little uh, lists of numbers should look like my first set of slides, right? Okay. I've now got a definition here of a major scale, a harmonic minor scale, and a pentatonic scale. Okay. All these are our message boxes, okay, which you've used before, but when you have multiple items separated by spaces, that's a list, okay? Max is really happy to deal with lists, although it gets a little confusing because most of the list uh, processes get handled by one object. That's the ZL object. Okay, so the name of this object is ZL, and the identifier that comes after ZL tells Max what operation you want to perform on those lists. Okay, so here's my, uh, let's see here. I don't have this one pre-made, so I'm going to have to remake this one. See that up there? I'm gonna. I'll toggle back and forth between Max and this. So, I've got this one saved. Move it to the side. I want to have a number box going into ZL lookup. And if you if you open up the help patch on ZL, you get a sense of everything that it does. They have to actually put multiple tabs with like alphabetical order of the different operations that it performs. <laughs> but lookup is the one that's most useful for dealing with these lists of pitch classes. Let me see if I can find it here. There it is. Okay. Output the nth element of the right list. So you send your list in this side of the object and then when you make queries here you actually get that item in the list. So that back to my earlier slides, when I was asking for the second scale degree, I was asking for the fourth scale degree. You can do that very easily with the ZL lookup object. So let's do that. Okay, this is now going to be comment scale degree Boop. at the top. Okay, this uh, shoot. I'm going to then create something down here which has outputs the pitch class. Okay, and I'm going to create this. So let's do pentatonic because it's shorter. 0, 2, 5, 7, 9. 0, 2, 5, 7, 9. So create a message. 0, 2, 5, 7, 9. That's my pentatonic scale. You send that into the right inlet of ZL lookup. Okay. And as soon as you send that message to ZL Lookup, it now has that information saved in its memory. Okay, and I can start to query the list here. 
So if I lock my patch and I start to say one, two, three, four, five's not going to output anything because it's actually it's actually going to number these items individually from zero, one, two, three, four. So it, it, even though there's five items in the list, they're numbered zero through four. Okay. That's one area you might have to stretch your brain a little bit if you haven't done too much work with arrays and computer mathematics. But if, you've t if you have done work with arrays, you're, you're familiar with this idea of starting to count from zero. Okay, That's all that's really happening behind the scenes, by the way. If you're familiar with arrays and, and like computer programming, Max is throwing this list of numbers into an array that you can now access each item in the array. Okay, so if you're The top uh, number box is an index. Is the index of the array. Okay. Yeah, so that, that help you understand what's going on here yeah. behind the scenes? Okay. No, I saw you actually asking for a number that is not that. No. Yeah. So what I'm typing in here, this is the index into the array, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And you see how I get these numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. So the nice thing about this is I can now decide, I think this is how my other patch is set up, I can add in my tonic. So if I decide I want my tonic to be middle C or 60, okay, this is me adding in my tonic. Okay, if I now, I don't know, I can from here I can go to MTOF and make a little synthesizer here. I'll do a sawtooth wave because I'm feeling sawtoothy. New easy DAC. So this is not in the patch that's on the slides, but again, it's it's always nice to hear what the, what it is you're working on, right? Uh, okay. Bye. Maybe I need to do this again. Okay, we see how that works. So now instead of playing 12 tone music all the time, I'm now playing pentatonic music all the time, okay? And I never hit a wrong note because all I have to do is I mean theoretically. I mean I, I know your reading talked about how a good instrument should be should allow you to actually make mistakes, yes. Okay, so keeping in with that theory, uh, I mean I could still play a wrong note here, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, everybody got their pentatonic scale working, or? Yep. Okay. So the other thing that I put, so that's, we've got a pentatonic scale working here, and I, I can use the scale degree as opposed to the pitch class, so to make sure that I'm hitting uh, specific pitch structures, okay? Um, if I turn this back on, if I decide that I don't want C to be my tonic anymore, I want, I'll, I'll go down a half step, or a whole step. Now 58. So now my pentatonic scale is... Okay, everybody here, it lowered it a, half, a whole step. Okay, so that's where changing the tonic comes in. Okay, uh, and I know some of you are thinking, uh, okay, well now I have to stay within an octave, right? Okay, but I could easily have one that's operating in a lower one engine over here that's operating in a lower octave, maybe my bass synthesizer. I could have another one over here that's my melody generator op operating in an upper octave. I could be changing octaves because if I uh, combine this reverse mathematics over here I could be talking about this synthesizer moves between octaves okay um, there's al also ways to get this scale degree so that if you go beyond the the array right you can fold back around and get the item in the array again okay um, I, I don't I don't want to get into that. That'll probably be more implementation implementation specific to what you guys are working on. Okay, whether whether we want to add 
octave jumping, that sort of thing. Um, but to, I, I showed you changing the tonic. Let's experiment with changing the scale. Okay, so I don't know. Let's see. Do you want to do a major scale or a minor scale or minor. harmonic minor? Zero, two, three, five, seven, eight, eleven. Zero, two, three, uh, three, five. Five, forgot already. Seven, five, seven, eight, <laughs> five, seven, eight, eleven. Yeah. Okay. As soon as I put this in here. Thank you very much. All right. So, so all I had to do is define my scale structure in this nice little uh, stru uh, structure. And if I, I mean, if I, an easy way to add the octave in would be what? I could just do this, and then lock it. Okay, so if you want to have the octave in there, you can do that. There's other ways to do it as well, but that's that's probably the simplest to just add the 12 at the end, because then you're going to have the octave in your set. Okay, are we starting to see the possibilities here? Okay, uh, you can implement if you can think of a scale structure, you can implement it. And oh, I haven't done this, but if we do, let's see. Uh, for those of you that are all you like quarter tones. Lest you think that these need to be integers, uh, this is going to have to be a floating point. So let me just do this. F. I'm going to have to add a floating point here. If I copy this and I'm going to paste replace right here. Okay, so now I can have a. Oh, it's cutting it off. Can I not send it again? There it is. Okay, so if you like quarter tones, there's an app for that. Okay, so, um, all right, so that's lookup tables. Pitch clock. Everybody understand that basic patch? Uh, there's an alternate way to use uh, list funnel and fun buff. Fun buff is what I, I grew up using. Uh, back in my younger Max days, basically, but ZL lookup is probably the easiest way to do it at this point. So, uh, if you see a patch that somebody else has created with Fun Buff, they're they're just using the same method. Okay, uh, so connect this with my uh, pseudo random number generators in Max. What might you do with those random earn drunk things? Well, you might make them specific to octaves or to certain scales. Yeah. So that would not be for creating the music. It's not just like. Yeah. Well, once you define this lookup table of pitches, okay, it's very easy to then randomly pick out a scale degree and create a melody that way. Okay. Um, it's also possible that maybe drunk would be a good way to handle octave jumping, right? Because you always want octaves to move not too far. You don't want to be jumping around five octaves at a time. You want to maybe jump one, maybe two octaves at a time, or, or no octaves at a time. So you want something to kind of, that kind of move in that Brownian motion way. So drunk ends up being a nice way to handle that. Uh, just to prove, uh, to get, not to get too far. Well, let's see. I think I have this on my slide. Yeah. Yeah, I have a slide for that. I should actually follow my slides. So adding a drunk object here for your octave control would change which octave you're in and generate the MIDI pitch down here, okay? Um, adding a random for the pitch class uh, in this scenario would, add, would um, I think, you know, this would, that would generate a random chromatic pitch, okay? But this, think, forget this top half here, okay? This number box where I have pitch class, if I were to instead incorporate this patch, at that location, I would all of a sudden get scale degrees all within an octave of each other. And if I had this working in tandem, it would move to different octaves along the way. OK. So let me let's see. What's, what's next on my? Yeah, OK, I'm going back to this. OK, so let me, before I leave this, just to make sure you guys get what I'm after here. So maybe instead of tonic as being 58, 
I want to do this. Let's see. So if you want to follow along here, feel free to augment your patch. I should probably save this at some point so I don't lose it. <laughs> uh, what do we want to call this? Scale gen. That sounds good. Okay. So I've got my scale generator here. And instead of Instead of adding in this tonic, I'm going to pull this over here, and I'm going to say I want to have a number box times 12 that lets me pick my octave over here, and I want to, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to first add it together. So this is now the pitch class of my tonic. I'll do this here. Just to label it. Tonic pitch class. Yep. This is tonic octave over here. Get out of my way. In fact, I'm going to just that, uh, throw this down here. Plus zero have to be a float? Like, because we're just multiplying... No, it doesn't, oh, actually. I'll go ahead and remove that. But I just wanted... I was trying to make the point uh, a minute ago that we've got... We could make it happen. Yeah, this is... And then down here, this is tonic MIDI note. Or MIDI pitch, to be explicit. Uh, if I could just spell pitch. Awesome. There we go. Okay, now... Here's where the fun begins, right? Drunk. Uh, let's give it a range of six, and let's constrain it so that it moves no more than two. Boom. I'm going to do this very fast, so... Um, so that's going to change my octave. I don't want to change this too much. I want to change this more often, and I want to know that I'm within the boundaries of my scale. So here's random 8, okay, and I'm going to connect, if you remember, my metro object. I'll make it a little faster, 300. Regulate the rate at which it's changing. Between the different and stuff, yep. Turn it on. I'm trying to fit it all on the screen with these nice big items. But this should. <laughs> it's really low octave, basically. So I might want to add three to this or something right here. Let me do this. So I'm not. 0 to 6, but I'll be 3 to 9. I've got that quarter tone in there, so let me get that out of there, because I don't, I don't really want to have that long term. Now I'm, I'm randomly improvising harmonic minor melodies. What now? And now it's changing. It's changing octaves literally every beat, right? Maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe go back to what we did on Tuesday. If we're counting beats, maybe only every fourth beat we want to think about changing octaves, right? So remember the counter and the select and making that connection there. Okay, you could easily do that as well. But pretty quickly, I've got a random uh, melody generator that improvises in a scale that I'm interested in, okay? And you may be concerned that if I change to this pentatonic scale, I've now only got five items in here. This is generating a random in terms of uh, five. If you go, ZL has another mode, I think it's called length, there it is. Nope, not co. 
length. Length does just what it says. It counts the length of the number of lists. So if you do this, it's going to change this random uh, index here to, be, to fit the length of whatever scale comes in. So when I change from pentatonic to... Okay, maybe I don't want to change octaves that... I'm going to save our ears a little bit here. Okay, so I'm improvising in a pentatonic scale. And the nice thing about this setup is it's the length takes care of different length of scales for me. Okay? Making sense? Okay? The, uh, I mean, these are the fundamentals of what you guys need to be able to do for your algorithmic composition patch. The, qu the question is uh, not how to implement it, but what you want it to do in terms of implementation. Okay? I mean, do you want to be randomly improvising on uh, 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 a payload scale, basically, and have a bass synth and a, a melodic synth, and then also some random rhythmic generator in the background as well. Okay, um, those are all within the realm of possibilities here, using these pretty basic techniques. Okay, uh, and I don't mean basic in terms of like everybody knows these. I mean basic in terms of it doesn't take that. It didn't take me that long to set this up, right? Right? I did that in a span of 30 minutes, right? And that was even stopping to explain every once in a while, okay? Um, so check that out. Maybe see the replay on that one, right? Because you're going to want those techniques, okay? Um, any questions? Because I'm down here. I talked about pitch class sets, okay? We talked about pulse and rhythm on Tuesday. Okay? It's a matter of how you creatively combine those things with your synthesizers. And I, I'll even say, if you want to use two of the synthesizers that you built from the first project and other synthesizers, like something commercial off the shelf, if you can figure out how to do that, that's fine too. Okay? But I do want you to incorporate two of your synthesis instruments from the first project. Okay? Um, so like nobody did any by which I'm saying nobody did any percussion synths. So if somebody has a percussion synthesizer that they want to bring in and, and have that add a percussion element to their their algorithmic composition, by all means, or play samples. Basically, you should you should know how to play samples from the tutorials, right? Loading in sound files and having those play as well. That would be okay as well. Um, to augment the instruments, you're not limited to the instruments that you created for Project One. I just want you to use at least two of the instruments that you created for Project One. Okay. So with my remaining time, I wanted to talk a little bit about Markovian mathematics and Markov tables. Okay, uh, This gets more advanced, but my reason for covering this is that there's a lot you can do with Markov tables that um, when I leave it to students, they kind of overlook Markov tables because it looks confusing and nasty and they just say, I want to run the other way and do something simple. Okay. Um, but I want to give you a demonstration of like what it is, uh, and I also want to put it in the context of showing you um, how should I put this? What I think is an appropriate level of technical and historical detail, because that's something you're supposed to include in your presentations. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to very quickly, uh, with the time that I have left, oh yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, run through the historical and technical details on Markovian t statistics, how it connects with music. Um, and present that to you not just as information but also as a demonstration of the level of historical and technical details I'd like to see in your presentations. Does that make sense? So you need to be perceiving this on two levels. One for a content information, one on a meta level of like I'm trying to demonstrate to you what I expect out of your presentations. Okay? Um, if you can handle that, you're all in a 400 level college course. Hopefully you can listen on two levels basically and if you miss it if you want to listen on one level right now and listen on the other level the second time it's all recorded yes okay um, so Markov okay um, where Markov kind of enters music okay because before well before it was a musical application it was a mathematical operations and there's a mathematician named Markov who's responsible for these Mark Markov tables and uh, Markovian uh, analysis Mark Markovian statistics but 
uh, where it kind of enters music production is through a composer by the name of Yanis Zanakis. Okay, uh, he's Greek by birth, but he's working primarily in France. Uh, reasons which I don't really have time to get into. Uh, although I'll give you a little bit of his background, maybe I'll give you a brief biological, biographical, not biological sketch, biographical sketch. That's what I meant to say uh, of uh, where he's coming from. Uh, he's educated in a boarding school. His parents are kind of of the upper middle class in Greece. Uh, he eventually goes to a polytechnic institute and studies architecture. Okay, so the important thing, even though he's most known as a classical composer or a contemporary classical composer, uh, he actually studies architecture in school. Um, that informs almost all of his musical outputs because he tries to adapt and apply a lot of the techniques that he learned studying math, studying uh, engineering, uh, to uh, music, okay? Um, his musical training starts really early with his mother. His mother teaches him piano, but she actually dies very early. If you see the, the timeline here, 1932, 1922. So he's only 10 years old and his mother dies uh, after starting to teach him piano, basically. Um, and that impacts his life um, going forward, basically. Um, he eventually flees to France, and I use that word intentionally, uh, during World War II. So looking at the time frame here, 22, World War II happens when? 40s, right? So he's in his 20s when World War II is going on, okay? Uh, he's actually involved in some of the Greek liberation uh, movement during World War II, trying to uh, press, push out first the, the fascist regimes that take over Greece, but then uh, once uh, Britain liberates the Greek islands, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the phrase greeted as liberators gets, got used in terms of the Iraq War, basically. The same thing kind of happened with the British and Greek isles. They were greeted as liberators at first, but then uh, the Greeks kind of turned on them, if you will. Uh, and Xenakis was actually involved in some of that. He was actually working it, as a militant in some of these resistance freedom fighter movements. Um, almost dies from a hand grenade explosion, uh, which leaves him kind of disfigured. It's part of the reason why when you see pictures of him, they'll, they'll always be illuminated on one side of his face because it's the part of his face that wasn't disfigured from the hand grenade explosion. Um, but he's essentially... Uh, when he leaves for France, he's kind of fleeing from uh, the authorities' justice, basically. Okay, uh, he's taken in France. He has this technical training. Uh, he's able to put that to use in an architecture firm uh, by an architect by the name of Le Corbusier, uh, who's a well-known contemporary architect in France, uh, uh, world renowned. Does a lot of projects throughout the globe. Um, he's working as an engineer on. Um, a lot of projects for Le Corbusier, uh, and applying uh, these mathematical structures. Uh, eventually, he leaves Le Corbusier's firm because he, um, how should I put it, uh, there's a dispute on one of the projects whether it should be credited to Xenakis because he did most of the legwork, or whether it should be uh, credited to Le Corbusier because it was his concept, basically. Um, so he leaves architecture. Uh, uh, meets his wife, uh, starts to pursue composition lessons, and essentially pursuing a different direction with his life, away from architecture, away from engineering, um, returning to this love of music, and applying all this technical knowledge. Um, his composition lessons, he's repeatedly turned down, but eventually he finds uh, uh, lessons with Mezien, which should, is a name that should ring a bell for some of you, right, uh, as an uh, important 20th century composer. Uh, so one of the things that happens with uh, composers throughout time is this kind of idea of lineage, who studied with whom, that sort of thing. Uh, so the fact that Xenakis studied with Mezian puts him in kind of a direct lineage with other important composers, basically. Um, and it's Mezian that encourages him that you have all this technical knowledge, all this advanced mathematic knowledge. Why not apply this to music and see where it leads, basically? Okay, and so that's where a lot of his thinking and his nudging comes from is applying these advanced engineering mathematical concepts to music, okay? So his music doesn't sound like you would, uh, like you think of classical music sounding because he's trying to apply a lot of these random processes from his engineering training to, and that were used to like stress test structures. He's trying to apply those mathematical formulas to music and see what he comes up with, okay? Uh, eventually, 
after years of uh, compositional practice, he puts together his ideas into this treatise called Formalized Music, which this is my copy that sits on my shelf, basically, because there's a lot of good ideas in here um, on how mathematics can be applied to uh, music. Uh, a lot of these ideas um, express themselves as random processes get played out in algorithmic composition, but for his purposes, uh, there are a couple different things that, that come out of this. One is the origins of granular synthesis are, show up in this. And if you know me and know my history in terms of my research agenda, granular synthesis is kind of important to me. That's my intersection with Xenakis. Um, and we'll talk about granular synthesis, granular processing when we get to processing in our next unit. But this is also where he outlines Markovian applications to music, Okay, how Markovian ma mathematics can be applied to music. And he uses it primarily as a, a concept for uh, applying these Markov tables, okay, and this looks kind of scary at first, although this is a very simple one, okay. What a Markov table does is, is it describes transitions, okay, particularly transitions from between states, not states like uh, Rhode Island, Mississippi, those type of states, but um, ways, uh, what settings for particular parameters in whatever application you're dealing with, okay? So if given two states, x and y, okay, you see how x and y show up on both dimensions of the graph, okay? And that's typical for Markovian tables is that you have the same dimensions running down the x and the y directions, okay? Um, what this is saying, the reason the arrow is pointing down, given the fact that my system is currently at state x, What's the probability that I'm going to move from x back to x? And what's the probability that I'm going to move from x to y, this other state? OK? And then, given a current state of y, what's the probability that I'm going to move to x? Or what's the probability that I'm going to move from y back to y? OK? They're all bordering each other. They're all point. Right. Well, right now, uh, the description of the system is 0.5. So I actually have an equal chance when I'm at x of going back to x or to y, or moving from y to x or back to y. Okay. Think of this as flipping a coin. If x and y are heads and tails, right? This is the description of a, of a perfect coin, right? Because I always have an equal, op op equal chance of moving back and forth between heads and tails, or in this case, x and y. Does it make, make sense so far? A simple Markov table, okay? Because from here, what happens is rather than just describing of I need a random number between whatever and whatever, you're one, you're outlining specific states that you want to be able to access, but two, you you actually have really fine control about how you move between those states, okay? So if I change the weightings here, and typically in a Markov table, these all add up to one, okay? So 0.2 plus 0.8 adds up to one. 0.8 plus 0.2 adds up to 1. Okay, everything down the column. Now I've changed the weighting. So in this case, if I'm going from x, I have an 80% chance that I'm going to stay on x, and I have only a 20% chance that I'm going to move to y. Once I move to y, I have, a 20, I have an 80% chance I'm going to stay on y, and a 20, excuse me, 80% chance I'm going to stay on y, and a 20% chance I'm going to move back to x. So I've changed the weight. This is, not, this is no longer describing a perfect coin flip, right? I've got a coin that's actually weighted to stay and keep repeating the same side over and over again 80% of the time. Okay? Uh, and this can be useful in musical operations. So flipping the script, okay, just by changing the ordering of the weightings here, now I've got something that 80% of the time is actually going to switch between the states, but only 20% of the time is going to stay at, at, in the same state. So we see the difference between this and this, even though the numbers are changed, where I put them actually matters because I'm describing how I'm moving back and forth between these states. Whether I want a system that's going to be, in essence, stuck and stay in a state and only rarely move, or whether I want something that has a lot of movement back and forth and only rarely stay stuck. Do we see those differences? Okay. Um, there's also the possibility of creating what's... Uh, you can have a zero condition as well. And in this case, y is always going to go back to x. So I'm never going to get stuck on, on y. That's what this means, basically, because I've got zero here. 
Okay. Is that clear to everybody as far as what the table is describing? Okay. It's, it's a little bit more complicated way of describing random processes because you actually get to choose the path between the different states, okay? And, and describe exactly how much percentage you want in each, each direction, okay? Uh, yeah, uh, th it is also possible to um, create issues for yourself. So this is a problem here. The fact that if I go from X, there's a 20% chance I'll stay at X, but in the 80% chance that I move to Y, the system now is going to get confused because it has no path forward. It's stuck at this point. It's stuck in the Y condition. Okay? So if, if there's no good path out, that's a, that can be a problem for Markovian uh, tables. Okay? So the Nakas' musical application of this is actually um, in terms of de deciding frequencies, intensities, and what he calls densities. Uh, and think of this as kind of duration as well. He, he, he describes the shorter the duration, the higher the density of, of, of notes, basically, in the music. Okay? And so he describes these tables in his book of like, okay, well, imagine in the case of intensities, you know, he's using G, G0 and G1, but think of this as forte and piano. Okay? If I have a forte measure, what's the probability that it's going to be followed by another forte measure? What's the probability that I'm going to go to a piano measure? If I'm in a piano measure, what's the possibility I'm going to I'm going to move back to forte, or what's the possibility that I'm going to stay with piano? Make sense? Same thing with frequencies. Same thing with durations. He actually compounds this and actually puts them together. <laughs> okay. So when I have a condition of this frequency, this uh, intensity, this density, what's the probability I'm going to move to this frequency, intensity, density? Etc. Okay, so he gets pretty complicated pretty fast, but you don't have to go to this level to find use in Markov tables. Okay, so there's two objects in Max that, if you pronounce them incorrectly, are kind of awkward. Okay, but this is anal as in short for analysis, and this is prob as in short for probability. Okay, I don't, you all are. Dirty minds, all of that. Okay, you're thinking of what this. Okay, so if you pronounce these incorrectly, it can be kind of socially awkward. Okay, but it's a now and prob. Okay, you, none of you are ever going to be able to forget the names of these objects now, right? Okay. Anyway, so they work in. Ta it, it, it's only compounded by the fact that they work in tandem. But anyway, um, so what prob lets you do is look at an input stream and populate the Markov table beneath the surface. So it keeps track of sta as states are coming in, and in this case, we can think of it. We could use this easily for MIDI pitches. I can. It keeps track of how many times I'm moving from one to the other. And actually, actually oh, excuse me. I, I I started talking about the anal object. I want to talk about prob first. Prob actually lets you build these tables, um, and you do it by this. So let's let me put it here. Okay. Um, I have a series of messages that I can send to the prob object. Okay. And the states that I'm describing are 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so I moved away from x and y to 1, 2, and 3. Okay, as soon as I click these, this object, it's as if I'm saying the transition, the likelihood of transitioning from 1 back to 1 is 0. And so Max puts this in the table behind the scenes. Okay, when I click on the next message, okay. What's the, pot, the, 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 the waiting from 1 going to 2? I want to put 1 here. So whatever you make the third number is the probability 1. Is the probability 1. Okay. So the first number is where you are. The second number is where you're going. The third number is your probability. OK? And it takes a series of messages to build up your Markov table this way. OK? But if I punch in these, the rest of these uh, messages, what I've essentially done is I've built this table here that I've just graphically shown you. Okay. What's inconvenient is Max has no user interface object for this object. Uh, there's no user interface for this, uh, graphical user interface, I should say, for this object. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, because I think part of the reason why it's underutilized is the fact that there's no graphical user interface for it. Okay. If, if they built a nice widget for it, it might get used more often. Anyway, okay. you may notice that these are not floating point numbers and they're not adding up to one, right? Okay. What Max essentially does behind the scenes is adds up everything in the column 
and then divides the values in the column by that number. Okay? And if you haven't defined it, it's, it defaults to zero as you build the table. Okay, so you don't have to define a zero transition. It just, if you don't want a zero, you can just define it that way. So you have to have three, you have to have three different places up there. So you couldn't say one and one, you wouldn't have that zero at the end. You need to give it that probability at the end. Yes, here you just need for three. The, just for the sake of syntax, yeah. I guess. Like, what I'm saying is as you build the table, if there's if there's several values where you're, you know there's gonna be zero, you can just leave them blank and not define them. It will define them as zero behind the scenes, okay? So this is now, this is effectively one divided by one, this is one divided by two, one divided by two, this is one divided by one, okay? So in this case, if I start out at one, one is always gonna to go to two. Okay, now I'm at two. Two has a 50-50 chance of either going to one or three. So let's just say 50% of the time it, it's gonna to go to three, okay? Now I'm at three, three is always gonna go back to one. So now I'm gonna to go to one. I'm going to go to two. Okay, now I got a 50 50 shot. I'll go back to one. Now I go to one. Now I go to see, how, see how you transition through this table? You're defining the order of the states coming out of the system. Yeah, Chris. So, is there a problem if you have a, if you have a table that doesn't uh, quote unquote repeat itself to more than one generator? Like, if it goes to one, it goes to two, and then say three, it says go back to two. Or if three, three. You can make like, it not work if you want yeah, it to. Yeah, like, so, make so it not repeat. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it's it's not a problem if it if it doesn't repeat a state over and over again. Yeah, that's not that's not a problem for the system. It's a matter of what do you want to define. Do you want it to actually repeat a value over and over again, or do you want it to always move from this value to the next value? Okay, and I'm talking about this in the abstract, but this could be pitches, right? If you want C to always go to D in your system, or you want C G to always go to F, you can do that. Um, or you can define other values, basically. Okay, so that's that's how the prob object works. Okay, let's talk about the anal object. Okay, what's nice about anal? It looks at a stream of numbers, and it actually spits out these messages that prob needs. Okay, so in that first example, I was using one, two, three, but it can e very easily have a transition table that's. 55 to 50, 53 to 55, well, that, that's happened five times, basically. It actually, it, the now object actually counts the number of times that 53 has gone to 55 and gives it a weighting of five. So it's just a counter kind of a problem? It's, it's a counter, of but it's a counter object. of the number of times that state A has gone to state B. Or whatever you said, yeah, yeah. whatever you picked. Well, so every time you different go, it's going to show up in different, like, you went from 53 to 55 and then like 60 to 62, would it change then back to 53 to 55? Would it reset it or what, does it? Remember? No, that stays in the table in the prob, prob object as part of the memory. Okay. It'll increment that to six. Okay. So the nice thing about these two things in tandem, you can actually take the now object and play a melody into it. And it will give you the statistical probability of every time this note goes to that note, this note goes to that note, and you get a table which describes the, the transition of that song, yeah, basically. You can then put that in your prob object and generate a new song with the same statistical probabilities as that first song. See the, see the potential here? Okay. This gets used in all sorts of applications. There's people that, you know, they've analyzed every bot corral basically okay and then they generate new bot corrals using the statistical weightings of all the analysis of all the bot corrals basically okay so that's the potential here of where we're going okay so uh, I don't know so I need to uh, well yeah so I did this to describe for you but I guess apparently I have already explained this right yeah yeah well, this is basically describing a, a, an analysis where if I said I wanted to always play G, then A, then G, then A, basically back and forth, this would be the table that describes it. Okay. Um, if I want to add in a C and an A, yeah. So as I'm playing these on the keyboard, it's adding these entries in it, basically. As soon as, as, soon as I repeat something, let's see, where'd it go? Yeah, it's going to increment by two. 
So I'm trying to visualize what's going on beneath the surface, but I think I've already kind of explained this process, okay? So hopefully you can visualize what's going on here. Let's see. Uh, okay. Okay, so how to do this in Max? Well, if you want to analyze your pitch and velocity as you play in, okay, you need the strip note object because that does what? Did anybody use strip note or no? In their first pad project? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to we did. Yeah, I think you did. Yeah. yeah. Strip note actually pulls out the note offs. You don't need to analyze the note offs. You need to analyze the note ons in order to do a pitch and velocity analysis. So remember, it playing the keyboard. It will. It will bias it toward um, repetitions because the note off is going to be the same pitch as the note on, and you don't really want that. Okay, so that's the function of putting the strip note in there. You just want to know where the notes start and which pitch they are. Okay, but you could easily do an analysis of pitch and velocity as you play something in, and then uh, feed that those anal outputs into the prob inputs, and then that bang button that I have there on this patch will create new values based on the analysis. Okay. Um, now this is just the raw pitch and velocity, but if you were to add this into some of the mathematics I was talking about before with modulo, the idea that you could sort by pitch class, and so you know that it's, you, you might want to normalize across octaves, right? So it's all the same. If you want to know you want to know that C is going to D, not necessarily that C is going to D in this octave or that octave or that octave, basically. So you, could, so you could do some pitch class mathematic. You could also talk about octave jumping. How often does it stay in the same octave or how often does it? So this, uh, this is, a, I mean, the raw data of pitch and velocity. But if you start to parse out the data a little bit more, you can start to analyze things like pitch class, octave. Um, velocity is a little tricky because there's 127 values, right? It's not necessarily as useful as doing a kind of coarse control of soft, medium, loud. So you could do something like divide by 20, and then you're, yeah, divide by 5. So you're dividing it up into five different zones, OK? Um, borax is another object that gives you a, a lot of other MIDI analysis. Is what it's, it's called borax after the, 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 cleaner, op, the cleaner powder stuff, OK? Um, uh, I'll skip over second order analysis. So, um, this I want to demonstrate here. So, this is my little patch that I, I've basically got a probability table that I've built that will change the velocity from note to note. So, let me, I've got this one actually built, and I think that's actually, oh, I got through all my slides. Awesome. Come on, get excited. Uh, where is it? I think it's this one. Yeah. So I'm putting this up on the board here for you to see, okay? I'm going to load in my table. So I've just saved all these values. And you can, uh, uh, you should know this from the tutorials. Comma basically separates this into separate messages as it goes into the prob object. Uh, I've got this one here. So let me turn this on. Okay, do I have another patch open? No. Make sure that that's actually this patch. Ah, uh, scale gen's still running in the background. Save. Turn it off, that one. Okay, so this one, yeah. I shouldn't be making any noise, okay, until I turn this on. We hear the stressed and unstressed beats kind of that are being created here. And what's nice about this, rather than just strictly random, is that you can, I mean, a stress beat is usually followed by an unstressed beat, right? And you can define that in your transition table. Because you typically want da, 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 da. That's all being generated by the transition table that I've defined here with these messages. Okay, so 
know I normalized by pitch, basically, so you can hear uh, that it's just the same pitch over and over again, basically. But the, the stressed and unstressed beats is all being created by this probability table, which is defining it. And the nice thing is that it's not, it's not a predefined loop of like four beats. It's, it's, it breathes a little bit more, and it seems to kind of ebb and flow, basically. But keep, don't neglect the idea of... Uh, accents and stresses in your algorithmic composition. Whether you do it by Markovian statistics or whether you do it by some other means, if everything is all normalized and playing the same velocity, it ends up sounding very cold and boring, basically. Um, okay, so that was my explanation of Markov statistics, okay, and Markov tables, uh, and how you can apply those in Max for a very basic algorithmic composition technique, okay. Did you get some insight into the like the level of technical and historical detail that I'm looking for in these presentations? Okay, I know I didn't show you maybe as polished and finished a final composition that I would like you guys to, to achieve, basically. But I wanted to make sure I was very clearly showing you uh, this Markov velo uh, velocity control, and maybe um, maybe that's something to think about for your presentations is having kind of a uh, a pre step to the final like demo basically where you demonstrate some technique that you're using in a, a limited clear fashion and then you show it in a larger context of a more fleshed out musical engine so to speak okay because uh, I could imagine taking another step and fleshing this out and then playing for you a full fleshed out song that also has pitch structures being randomized and the stressed and unstressed beats is what's being controlled by Markov statistics okay okay any questions about all this? Because that's what my next slide says: is questions, comments. <laughs> is this? Yeah, I mean, I, I get. I threw. A, I, I will admit, I threw a lot of information at you guys today. So I know it's going to take probably some time to digest. Um, hopefully, the recording will allow you to go back and uh, play things, play segments of things that you might want to implement. I will. Um, I haven't gotten around to indexing the ones from Tuesday yet, but I'll index the ones from today too. Hopefully, the if you look at the comments on the YouTube uh, videos, you'll notice that there's like time indexes to let you jump to specific topics. Uh, that's hopefully helpful rather than sitting around and watch, trying to watch a whole hour class again, basically. To, so, oh wait, he said something about this. Let me jump to that, basically. Um, uh, I think that's that's all I wanted to cover. Any other questions from you guys? So Tuesday, I'm going to do a little bit on showing you like network community. Just, just expose you to the idea that you can have two copies of Macs on two different computers talking to one another, okay? Because that, that's, that in itself is cool. Whether you optionally implement that as far as your part of your uh, patch is, is fine. I mean, maybe you want uh, your algorithmic engine sitting on one computer playing two different synthesis patches on two different computers, basically. That's one com possible configuration. Uh, the reading actually might give you some other ideas about how to deal with uh, the network as a feature of a musical ensemble, okay? So be, be sure to do that reading on, on network music, okay? I'll leave you here. Have a good weekend. <laughs>